This podcast was created during the 2023 WGA and SAG after strikes. We understand that without the creative influences of these unions, we wouldn't have a show to talk about. So we encourage you to continue to contribute to the Entertainment Community Fund. You'll find the link in the show notes and continue to support it even after the strike is over. Thank you. Morgays, the Queen of Andor, has issued the following proclamation. This podcast shall be discussing the most recent episode of Wheel of Time. If you have not seen that episode and do not wish to be spoiled, go witness the Dragon Reborn in the latest episode and then return. So it is written, so shall it be done. Hey. Hey. The face is like amazing. Yeah, I, I call him my uh, my uh, uglier twin, but yeah. Welcome to Bustin' Blockbusters. My name is Double M. I am joined by Bubba and Priscilla, and today we are going to be talking about season two, episode one, entitled "Taste of Solitude," written by Amanda Kate Schumann and directed by Thomas Napper, and season two, episode two, "Strangers and Friends," written by Catherine B. McKenna. Directed by the same director, Thomas Knappen. Here's your synopsises. Len, Nynaeve, Egwene, Perrin, and Matt find themselves more alone than ever. And River Youths forge new relationships while Len tries to mend an old one. And we're going to jump right into the ratings here in a minute. But before we do that, we need to be upfront with anybody who is listening to us or watching us on YouTube exactly where we are in terms of a book's perspective because this is a 14 full book and one novella series uh that robert jordan and brandon sanderson finished for him as well so there's a lot to read and we want you to know where we stand on all of this stuff priscilla let's begin with you i'm not exactly sure how far along you've read i know you've been reading to try and go along with the seasons but i don't know if you've read any further than that no, uh, I'm trying to like follow the seasons no? and uh, the three first books. The first three Not books. Not the, the prequel. Not the prequel. There is yeah. a prequel. Yeah. I that's, didn't read the prequel. Right. That's what we call book zero. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, okay, so you're through The Dragon Reborn, which is the third book. Or mm-hmm. Have you finished it or are you holding off on Shadow Rising? No, I I didn't go to Shadow Rising. So, okay. but you have finished Dragon Reborn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. And Bubba, uh, I guess you are. I I mean, I know that the internet is a hard place to avoid spoilers from, but as far as I know, you're still a book free person. I have not read any of the books. Spoiler a bit for my rating. These two episodes may make me want to read the books. Oh. Interesting, interesting. And folks, I have read all 14 of the main books and the prequel. I uh, I did read New Spring, which is the prequel, which there was a nice little story from in one of these episodes, which I loved uh, very much seeing recounted. And there was uh, a whole lot of rereading that I've done over the last two years, although I'm going at a slower pace and I'm listening to other podcasts because I'm not going to offer any opinions on the books that you haven't already heard. Uh, but I am now up to book seven of my reread, A Crown of Swords. Uh, I did completely finish Lord of Chaos, which is, in my opinion, one of the best books of the series. It and Shadow Rising are two of my favorites. But that's where we are. Let's not delay any further. Let's get right into our ratings. Oh, hail the court of Morgay's Queen of Andor. Is now in session. Hail. Hail! The Queen will now hear proclamations of ratings for this episode of Wheel of Time. Double P, Princess Priscilla, what do you rate this episode on a scale of 1 to 10? Are these two well, episodes combined, I guess? Okay, uh, I would give them both together. Uh, so let's see. 8.7 double R's. Wait, double R's? 
Yeah, Randall Rand. Because he was like, where is Rand? He just, just popped up, said hello, and then did the same thing again in the second episode the, uh, with an, a new friend, Celine. No, and I was expecting more from Rand in these two episodes, and I got opposite. So I was very surprised. Like uh, I got a lot of Nynaeve, a lot of Moraine, and uh, a lot of Perry, but not that much Rand. Anything else about uh, the episode in particular that raised or bumped your rating from what it might have been? Um. I mean, uh, I have to be honest, I think Moraine is my favorite character in the series, like in the TV series. Not only because of who is playing her, but also like I really like the way they are adapting her to the screen. So I think the first episode, uh, I was a little bit uh, not frustrated with her. But, you know, she's like holding so much things from Len and like as a consequence of also from us, the audience, that I was like a little bit miffed, I have to say, with her. Yeah. Uh, but I understand what where she's coming from and where she's going. It's just that I wanted more from her, let's just say. So it was so a, did a Lan. case of... Ex- yeah, exactly. It was a case of unmet expectations, not that the, the plot wasn't uh, doing it for me. It's just that I wanted more. The Princess Priscilla has declared her rating. So it is written. So shall it be done. Hail. Bubba, what was your rating for these two episodes? Season two, episodes one and two. Matt and Priscilla. Princess Priscilla went 8.7, combining the episodes, 8.7 out of 10. That is incredible. That is crazy because it's too low. I'm going 9 out of 10 double Fs. Wow. Of course, if you've been watching Wheel of Time all this time, what does double F stand for? Finally focused. Holy smokes, the show is really good. It's like really good at the end of season one. As someone who's not read the books, who doesn't know these characters, doesn't know these stories, at the end of season one, it was like, oh, this is the story you're trying to tell? And I I enjoyed season one in parts, but it was scattershot. It was unfocused. It was uneven. These two episodes convinced me they know where they're going. They have a focus, and it is great. I remember back at the beginning of when we were talking about season one, I thought Egwene was the main character. I thought, oh, the way the show is told, it's all about her. Here in season two, it feels like she, so far through two episodes, has the slightest storyline, but it doesn't matter. In the first season, everybody told me, oh, Matt's my favorite character from the book. Matt's my favorite character from the book. The first season I watched it, I thought, Matt is the worst. I hate him. Kill him. Enough of Matt. Two episodes into season two, and I'm like, Oh, I get it. Matt's cool. I, I, more time with Matt. Let's go. In season one, I thought Lan was the lamest character. And through two episodes of season two, yeah, he's still lame. I don't like him at all. He's the worst. But they gave him a good fight at the end of season one. Plus, I mean, at the end of episode one, I should say. But the final thing I want to talk about, this show has finally given me a chance to play along with every episode. Every episode, we meet a new character. And I get to wonder... Is this character a dark friend or a sex friend? <laughs> <laughs> They're in there all the time. Rand has Rand maybe has met a couple of each so far in the first two episodes. I think it's really good. I'm excited. This is the show. If I were a book reader, which I'm not, and I don't know the story of the book, but I this is the way the story I imagine goes in the book, and I think it's great. The Lord of Chaos has given his rating. So shall it be written? So shall it be done? Hail. And I'm going to give a rating uh, slightly higher, although I'm really mad at Priscilla right now for stealing my R's. Uh, So I'm going to have to upper just a little bit. But I'm going to give this 9.3 out of 10, what I like to call quadruple R's. Quadruple wow, arts. Quadruple yeah. Rand's Randy rental arrangement. Those are my four <laughs> R's. No, doesn't work. Okay. Well, Close. never mind. I here's what it is. I ended last the last season of Wheel of Time with a whole lot of issues regarding how they wrapped up the series. 
Turns out a lot of that was COVID related, but I still had an issue that comes up in this. And this is really the only thing that detracted both episodes for me. No mention of how loyal got, uh, got survived Mm -hmm. (laughs) that stabbing. Would they not just at least say something about that? Instead, they treat it just like most politicians do. If it's something you don't like or something that you're getting negative feedback on, just move on. And and we'll just everybody will forget about it eventually because we all live minute to minute uh, on the Internet these days. That was my only complaint. I mean, otherwise, I absolutely love this episode. Everything looks better. The drama is certainly better. Uh, the score of Lauren Bow's score to me is better. Uh, and I think that Bubba, after the last three weeks of talking about Ahsoka, you can probably agree that the dialogue's better, right? 100% Matt. Yeah. So I, I just absolutely loved it. There were lots of changes to the books because they left the characters in, in situations, uh, where they couldn't do part of the first book and they brought some of that second book into the first season anyway. So considering all of the changes and considering the journeys that they're going to go on which is clearly towards a destination where they can be reunited i am just tickled pink there were surprises that were different from the books that just made me squee and also made me cry there were just all kinds of things you clean up after yourself when you squeed so it is written so shall it be done So, folks, that's what we think. We want to know what you think. There's multiple ways you can contact us, either through my podcast or through the Double P media conglomerate uh, that is covering right now a couple of murder mysteries, comedy murder mysteries like After Party and Only Murders in the Building or uh, Ahsoka for Star Wars, depending on whether you want to call that a comedy or a mystery or not. And... Uh, you can reach out to them by tweeting to at the word double the letters PHQ. Actually, all the social medias at the word double the letter PHQ, including Facebook. You can hit me up on the social medias at bust blockbuster. And then you can send emails to me, Matt's audio blog at gmail.com, M A T T S audio blog at gmail.com. And you can leave comments on the wonderful YouTubes that Bubba will be putting up. They will show up on the Double P Media YouTube. That's the other spelling you need to know. Double P Media, the word double, the letter P, the word media, for YouTube, for their website, and also for their email. Hello at doublepmedia.com. gentlemen welcome to the game that's sweeping the nation this is coach t here with you don't remind me that i kind of sound like oh coach o from lsu he's long gone i'm still here and i just want to say that these are some fabulous questions our contestants today are going to be priscilla and matt and bubba will ask the questions and whoever comes up with the better answer between priscilla and matt bubble will decide so we all know that matt's going to lose every one of them but that's okay the first question bubble would you read it please well at the beginning of the very first episode of season two and this got this was like a sneaker scene that they added on to the end of season one but the first scene we see in season two is of a young woman a young girl who's outside she gets scared she runs inside and then this evil dark one friend his uh lieutenant i can't even say it correctly uh brings the girl outside to meet one of these scary beasts and he's like you know what if this beast isn't good or evil it's just hungry and he pets the beast and he encourages the little girl to pet the beast i thought this scene was great it was tense it was you know like edge of your seat what's gonna happen but the beast didn't eat the little girl would the scene have been better if this beast which maybe is good maybe is evil maybe neither maybe just hungry 
would it have been a better start to the season if this beast had eaten the little girl? I'm going to come to you first, Matt. Okay, I'm going to remind our contestants that whatever one person answers, the other person must answer the opposite. That's the one rule that I forgot to bring. Hey, this is a brand new game for me too. So I'm just going to try and, and figure this out. I was going to tell Priscilla to go first, but I'll, Matt, you must go first. Coach, I hate the way you host games. Anyway, yes, it would have been so much fun to see, and you can decide, Bubba, whether I'm answering this sarcastically or not. It would have been so much fun to just see a girl only to her elbow, uh, everything else below gone. As she and and the Ishmael, the, our our lieutenant, is uh, is stroking her hair and going, there, there. It's not that difficult. Give him the rest of your arm. I think that that would absolutely be fantastic. That's exactly the kind of blood and guts that I want to see on my quality television from Amazon Prime. And that's my answer. Uh, well, to be perfectly honest, as a Trollic, I kind of like that answer. Uh, but I can't tell if you're being sarcastic or not because you're a terrible actor, Matt. Priscilla, you're up. Which is, incidentally, my opinion. Uh, no, come on. Come on. Like, we already ended uh, the first season with a murder no? of a child by a huge wave, a tsunami. So I think it would be of bad taste to start the second season already killing another child so i i have to say uh, the, the, the their choice was the right one now let the child leave let her see another day let the trollic uh wait for breakfast i am gonna have to rule in favor of priscilla but there is a caveat to this i think if the story really is, hey, these beasts aren't good or evil, they're just hungry, doing what they should be doing, then that's I... That's exactly right. That's what we are. We're if not that's what the story is really trying to tell us, that these evil people really are, have a cause, you know, they're just living as they were created, then I do think you let the girl live. But if your goal is to really continue to make us afraid of these Trollocs, of these beasts, of these evil people, then I think you need to, this sounds terrible, kill the little girl. But because I don't know the story, I'm going to assume the showrunners are going for the former option. So because of that, I'm gonna vote for Priscilla on this first round. Continuity Thank is you. a good thing to have. Excellent first round. This round goes for double the points. Uh, Bubba, your question. Well, this also ties a bit into that first scene. So we're at a meeting of the dark friends and at the table, people, I guess, are trying to keep their identities hidden so that nobody can, you know, backstab each other. But Padden Fane, you know, he kind of raises up his little cover and he smiles at the girl. And this actor is so creepy. He is so evil. I think one of the things season one did great is it made me hate this guy so much fear this guy so much hate him so much but then later on we're told well hey maybe Patton Fane had a reason for releasing Trollocs on your town the two rivers and killing everybody so here's the question and Priscilla you're gonna go first on this one can the show and I mean the over the overriding show truly make an evil SOB like Patton Fane have a good motivation for releasing Trollocs on the two rivers and doing all this evil? Yes or no? And why? Let's hear it, Priscilla. I don't think so. Like, um, we, we didn't see a lot of Pad and Fane to understand, like, the deepness of his evilness so far. So we he's just, like, a, a very creepy dude who is doing, like, this strange stuff and appearing here and disappearing then appearing there i think like if you give every each villain like some real good motivation or like a plan inside a plan it gets too complicated so at this point in the story where you are starting no like uh, it's a good thing just to say no this guy is just he's just trying to steer stuff 
he's just doing this because he's evil. He like he didn't like the people from Two Rivers. He just sent them Trollocs. That's it. I think it's good. Like if later on we we find out that there is a good reason, then okay. But uh, then it will add too much layers to a, a character that is already like uh, that you ha that you love to hate. So that's to me the essence of Adam Fane. You love to hate him. That's Excellent. gonna be a tough thing to beat there, Matt. Coach Trollick, what any pointers for Matt on how he's gonna uh, counter that argument? Well, I'm just going to say that it's impossible for Matt to counter that argument right now, but I'm going to give him a chance. I, I don't even know what to do with that. Okay, here, Priscilla, I think your argument is fabulous. I think it's wonderful, but you're completely wrong, and here's why. I don't think that Perrin was interpreting what Pat and Fane was doing in his little visions correctly at all. I think what you were actually seeing was Pat and Fane doing things like helping little girls get away from fires like uh you know standing around and helping everybody going being a an emergency worker and saving the day every time that all of these terrible things happen Pat and Fane has done nothing wrong he's merely holding on to the horn of Valir which he stole granted but only because it was in the incapable hands of the Shinar. I mean, let's look at it. Pat and Fane is a very complex guy. He's not going around destroying these people. He is going around saving them. And sometimes he doesn't work for it, out for him. You know, he's not the world's best savior, but that doesn't mean he's not trying. Well, I thought it would be impossible to take down Priscilla, but you were shoveling so much Trolloc droppings right there, Matt, that I'm giving you the vote of support just for go for really pulling it out of your Trolloc, if you know what no, I mean. No, that was on, crazy. Hang on, hang on. I take offense. That was so ridiculous. What are you doing I loved offending it. I love it. It was ridiculous. What are you talking about? The Let's spin the tiny wheel of topics. There oh, are okay. all kinds of topics on the list. And uh, they may fold into some other little segments as, as we go along. But we have Forsaken or Chosen. So that ah. I think all the Forsaken and Dark Friend scenes. We have Rand's got uh -huh. a girlfriend on the wheel, uh, which we might insert the Rand haters thing here, much to Bubba's chagrin. The Hunt for the Horn uh, <laughs> is another one on the wheel here. Uh, this one is the one thing that I left on from Bubba's contribution. Leandrin is effective in turning Nynaeve to the dark side. And I included all things regarding the White Tower. And then we have Moraine's storyline as our sixth or fifth item on the wheel. Our sixth item on mm -hmm. the wheel is so many new characters. Oh, my gosh. As if there weren't mm -hmm. enough names to remember already. So. Let's give the wheel a spin. Priscilla, that wheel, it, the writing on it is way too tiny. I only was able to read the subjects before because they're on a piece of paper here. Can you peer at that wheel and tell me which subject came up? So Rand's got a girlfriend and it's <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Rand's yeah, got we need a to girlfriend. Talk. Well, what it do you want to say about that. anything regarding Rand's? You, you've you already expressed some disappointment in the Rand storyline uh, in these first two episodes. What do, you, what do you have to, or is there a point that you want to bring up between all of us to talk about? I mean, you got to give it to Rand. Like, he is really squeezing that the melons, the, 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 the melons on the lime, the lemon, <laughs> lemons. <laughs> That life gave him because, uh, like he ended on a terrible note, uh, season one, and then like we all kept wondering what's what, 
what is Brand doing? Like he's devastated. He is like far from the woman he loves. No, he's far from his friends. Everybody thinks he's dead now because he asked Moraine to. And he's, uh, he knows that he's slowly going to uh, be, uh, get mad no? because of the, the taint. So what? What will Rand do? And then, lo and behold, Rand is there, like, living the life. Like, living the life of a, an angst teenager, like, uh, with, like, an older, uh, very beautiful woman. Uh, uh, like, every night, she goes there, and he pays his rent. Like, every night, he's paying that, that rent, and he has, like, a, a job. I, I was like, what is going on? Why is Ren so set up? No, he's not suffering. He's not, uh, he's, he has all figured out. And it turns out by episode three, he really has all figured out. He has a plan. And I was like, I, am I imagining things? Is Ren becoming like, uh, efficient now? Smart? <laughs> what happened? What, what happened? Yeah. Well, I think that there's an awful lot of atrocities in there too. But first, Bubba, any points you want to bring up about Rand uh, and, and his life in the foregate? Well, once again, I haven't read the books. I don't know where this is going. You get the idea at the end of season one, or I did at the end of season one, that he's just going to take off and you know go you know kind of live a hermit life. But instead, I love what Priscilla just said. Rand has a plan. And, you know, gosh, I wish I was young again and could pay the rent every night. But he's, you know, he, he's doing things he wants to do. I thought the way he treated his first patient, in the, the first patient we saw him with, I thought I was like, look at how nice Rand is to this old person. These old people who are suffering in a way that he may suffer later in life. I thought it was great. The one thing, and don't spoil me if you guys know, the one thing I just naturally assume based on what happened in season one, is that Celine, I believe her name is, Rand's uh, sex friend, I I fear she also might be a dark friend. But I thought it was great. I thought it was interesting. And uh, I'm only to episode two, the cliffhanger of, hey, he's going to hook up with Loghain. I loved it. I thought it was great. I think he's he's not used much. So Priscilla's right. If If he's the dragon reborn and it really should almost be more focused on him he's not in these episodes much but when he is in these episodes he's effective and he, he it's an effective use for the show and as priscilla said which was so wise he is effective in his goals i, I liked spending time with him okay yeah I, I i love that you guys love these stuff i'm i'm going to take my talk on this wheel of topic to open up rand haters And here's why I hate Rand so much and continue to hate Rand, despite the fact that you guys are seemingly more enjoying him more than you did before. I don't think there's any way that you can live in this place and Rand can effectively not affect you. <laughs> he always he's he gets free bread from people. People throw bread at him every morning. What the heck is that? <laughs> They just say this guy has never eaten carbs. Let's give him some carbs. That's all yeah. it is, man. Yeah. I, I I say he's paying the, for the bread too. Oh yeah. man, if he's paying the same way he's paying for the rent, this guy's got to be more tired than he, he is. He must be exhausted. He must be exhausted. <laughs> but isn't there so many characters in this these two episodes that could absolutely hate Rand? Think about that poor warder who he waited till he got drunk and then beat him up. I mean, that's just awful. How about wait? He uh, was a jerk, though. Like he beat up a jerk. You are better. treating it look, as like, look at a, how Indiana assault Jones punched is that assault. No, Bubba. you are treating this like, look at how Indiana Jones hit that young soldier. Not mentioning what side the soldier fights for. The Nazis, Matt. The guy was a jerk. Maybe the guy was, Rand, hey, maybe Rand, Rand went Rand too far on him. Like, just on. as an Rand is being just as bad to that patient as he was. What is Rand doing? Rand's trying to fool him into thinking that he's just a friend, just so he can learn some hair and mark sword, uh, sword moves. And, you know, the cat's paw, the whatever, the swing here, the, the do there. He's using him. 
He's not there to help him. He's not his friend like they all claimed in all of the interviews beforehand. He's not befriending him. He's just using him to learn more sword moves from an old war veteran. This poor guy has PTSD, and he's well keeping it in his mind with all of that other stuff. I, I just can't get it. And he's merely using the guy so that he gets an opportunity to get to low gain, which is his real thing. I mean, for crying okay. out loud, all right. yeah. he's lied to his friends through Moraine that he is dead. And uh, he's just causing anguish all over the country. All these kids are scattered to the four winds and they're all still mourning Rand, who is just sitting there living the good life in the slum. I just think the question <laughs> is that no one should hate Rand. I think it's that everyone should hate Rand. Wow. Dedicated to Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time book series. I feel so strongly about both episodes. I need two different ratings, one for each. Okay. For good. episode two, for a newbie, for somebody who doesn't know anything about this story, I'm giving episode two 10 what I like to call double R's out of 10. And to the Wheel of Time TV show on Amazon Prime Video. I'm shocked by the 10, first of all, Bubba, because you never do that. But uh, now I'm really tripped up. Double R's? Yes, Rotten Rand. In the first podcast, you were like talking Rand hate. And I was like, what has Rand done? Rand seems perfectly fine to me, a newbie. In this second episode, he does some really rotten stuff. You're listening to Bustin Blockbuster's Wheel of Time coverage. Look, I didn't choose this path for myself any more than you did, but I will follow it because I must, 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 must. Let's talk about the thing that I thought. Uh, I, Nynaeve was a character in season one. I didn't dislike her. I didn't love her. But I think her scenes in these first couple episodes of season two, Nynaeve is very effective. She is being turned to the dark side. And it's almost a dark side where you're like, oh, yeah, that's logically go to the dark side by this red. Uh, uh, I'm going to miss Aja. Her. Right. A red Aja. Aja and her name is Leandrin. Is that correct? Yeah. Leandrin. Yeah. Okay, yes, yeah, that actress is is wonderfully creepy and evil, and I think Nynaeve is doing a great job of how somebody could slip to the dark side. I, I, I loved it, so I really don't have more to say other than I think it's a very effective and almost logical progression for this character. What I'll say about the character who I thought was the main character of the series when we started back in season one, Egwene, is that right now her story seems pretty slight, but the... Egwene moves in and, and becomes friends with the snob, but the snob turns out to be okay. That was a twist I didn't see coming. It moved very quickly, and I could see how Egwene could have a new friend, and I'm interested to see where it goes. So nothing to say other than I liked my time in the White Tower. I even liked that the the instructor kind of uh, back and forth, which uh, maybe I didn't glam on to so much in the first season. I thought it was very effective. Excellent. Priscilla, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts about Nynaeve or anything else or Egwene or anything else happening in the tower because the big thing for me of course was the introduction of Elaine who for book readers that's a big deal mm -hmm. we can talk more about that in a minute when we get to New she's Year. the she's the heir the the what I would call the snobby friend almost yeah exactly okay I think it's a really like the way they frame it I really like the the friendship between Nynaeve and Egwene how they are on different paths you know, yeah. on different like uh levels, no? uh how the sisters of the White Tower see them differently. Like I Egwene is there because she's ambitious, because she wants to be there. And I need no, uh no, she doesn't want to be there. She's there because of Egwene. And despite having this like large uh the largest amount of power at her disposal, she cannot uh, make use of it unless she's in the situation where she's being pushed to her limit, which um, like Leandrin can see that, uh, and she's trying to find a way to reach Naini through this uh, through this point, no? or like pushing Naini until that she can unblock herself so that she can channel. 
And Egwene is ready for the taking. She's like, she's ready to learn. She is willing to do. And it's, it's a very interesting view on a relationship that is, has always been very close. No, like that Nynaeve has always been the caretaker and I, Egwene has always been in a, in like in this learning, like being nurtured by Nynaeve. And at some point, Nynaeve is starting to, I wouldn't say jealousy, but it's very close to jealousy, what she's experiencing because uh, Nynaeve has everything, but doesn't make use of it. And Egwene, she wants to go there, but she cannot because everybody's pulling uh, putting focus on I need no? mm. um and I like how this is straining their relationship and I also like uh ba- Baba doesn't didn't see but by episode three we have a, like a wonderful a really wonderful uh resolution of this conflict that is like under the surface there Mm -hmm. Uh, because uh, like in life you can be great friends with somebody and you can be like on different paths on different uh, periods of your life and even if you feel a little bit uh, frustrated or a little bit envious of your friend you don't leave this friend behind and that's what happens in this friendship really really like the way they are doing their friendship it's a true friendship. It's a true relationship that has like ups and downs and has moments of doubts. And I need in particular, she is so insecure. She's so, she's so like, uh, she has so many fears that she has to face it. And instead of facing, she's always blocking because she cannot uh, admit to herself that she's failing. No? Um, and they managed to, to bring this everything uh like everything like on the relationship on the friendship on their struggles so i really like it and um i mean we already have a resolution by by episode three baba of this that is happening um uh, but it's something that um i i really uh, you you know where the story is going like we have a lot of stories that they are a little bit open now uh yet you don't you are not sure where they are going but this story you know where where it's going and you know you're going to like it because the way they are taking they are taking very seriously and like taking very good care of it if you recall back in season one when moraine returned to the tower she told leandrin i know about the man in north harbor and one of the things that i really loved about that was that it was just an implication that maybe Leandrin had a guy on the side or whatever. And now we get what the sense of that is. It's an interesting big change to the books in terms of Leandrin's age, which I thought was amazing. But Leander goes to the North Harbor and she sees a guy who is very much uh, older and and actually naive because of the medicine being employed or poison, depending on what you want, thinks that she's just trying to kill this guy for whatever reason. Now, I suspect that Moraine probably thought that this guy was probably her lover or whatever. As it turns out, he is her son. Can you believe that? So Leandrin is much older than the way that the books portrayed her, which was that she was born in uh, about what? 40 to 50 years before uh, all of these events instead she must be much older than that to have a son that is that old and has died it is unbelievable to me that that made me feel so much emotion for leandrin uh i cannot remember it kate fleetwood fleetwood that's the actress's name totally moved me i felt terrible for leandrin uh with with her son there i and and i was amazed by how naive was you know how she felt bad for even following her i don't although i don't think she figured out that much but at least she and, and the way that she diagnosed leandrin's son made leandrin feel even worse i just oh it was so horrible priscilla let me turn back to you what did you think about that uh, well, I I was very confused about his identity to begin with. 
uh, I fought first like they were married. Then I fought his his father, um, uh, her father. Oh, then mm-hmm. no, uh, but like I was in doubt if he he, he was her uh, son because she she refers to him as like my love and then a uh, beautiful boy. So it was like. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know what's going on, and uh, I really enjoy that you don't give, you don't get the answers like fed to you. You have to figure out yourself. No. Uh, so well, well, can I moment, can I for... jump in, Priscilla? Because uh-huh. I haven't read the books. This may not be in the books, but when she said my son, I, I you for me, I flash back, and she was just talking about, hey, we can make ourselves age slowly with our power, and I thought. Is this old do her son? I loved it. I thought that was a great twist. Once again, mm-hmm. the White Tower politics and the uh, different color ajas, I c- kind of picked up and enjoyed a bit in season one. But here in season two, I'm all in. It's great. So to learn that she has like uh, such a, a deep relationship with her son, apparently and uh that opens a lot of questions about her past now was she married before what happened why she why did she go to the white tower why did she chose the red aja what is she doing so this perhaps will explain later on like her the true allegiance is like whoa what is going on with her and like this uh, just the scenes that we saw can explain the whole background and her, uh, her choices and the future choices that she will make. All the social medias are the word double the letters PHQ or bust blockbuster. And always leave comments on our YouTube videos when you see them. Hit that like button. Hit that notification bell. As my friend John McGonigal reminds me, I must say, hit that notification bell. Yo. Uh, and therefore, you will be in. I evidently, you know, something will Im- absolutely make you hit that notification bell. You can want You're going to want to know when all double mm-hmm. when the double P videos, all of them come out because you know. I have to say a- something. Uh-oh. I have to say something. Here we if go. If people hit, <laughs> if they hit the like button, their life will change. I'm seeing right now. I'm like Min. I can see the threads. Yes. We promise you. <laughs> all right. Let's spin the wheel. Oh, I can't read it, Priscilla. You're going to have to tell me what's on there. You can't read it. No. Oh, my God. Okay. Okay. So many characters. So many new characters. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I I got a small list here, and this is in all of the new ones, but we have Varen and Adeles. Uh, They're Mm -hmm. the two women that Moraine was staying and Lamb were staying with. And I guess it's Varen's warder, Tomas. Uh, we of course have Elaine Tracklin, who is the daughter heir uh, that is befriend- befriending Egwene. We have Shiriam Sedai, who is the mistress of novices, and uh, she is, I guess, just kind of like the principal of the school. Uh, we have Celine, who is brand new and uh, is having a great time with Rand right now. Uh, there yeah. was in the Aes Sedai, the very first Aes Sedai meeting, there was another. Uh, I said I in there, uh, the one that had her hair shaved or her, I guess, cut very close. Uh, if she not a background actor, Matt, I'm not sure that should count. She's not a background actor. The person, there was a new character throwing bread at Rand. Come on. No, no. <laughs> she had she had lines. Her name is Joya Bayer. And those of you who have read the books will know that name. Then we have Elias, uh, who is the new tracker who seems to have the same kind of uh, talents that Perrin has. And we have Inktar uh, and Masima, who are two new uh, Shinaran characters that are traveling along with that group as well. Who did I miss, Priscilla? What is the name of the captain? Uh, Bale Doman. The captain is a new one. Yeah. Bale Doman. Is uh, he is a captain who I, I, I love there. the addition of him. Who is in the also. books? No. Yeah, yeah, he, he's in the he's books. He's in the first yeah. book, uh, and so I love the little drop of uh, the mention of Whitebridge 
which was not included in the television show. But that uh-huh. little drop of white bridge was the last time that he saw those fa- those dudes in the in the hoods, which turned out to be fades. Uh, that was a wonderful yeah. little book nod. And uh, mm-hmm. she said to for him to get out of uh, get out of there, get out of town as quick as possible. Uh, so will we see him again? Uh, I don't know. Well, I do know how it would go in the books, but I'm not going to say anything more about it here. Uh, not in this section anyway. Yeah, uh, he, he gets into something. No. Yeah. And then there is uh, there is, of course, uh, the the gentleman who is teaching Rand how to do the hair and mark blade. Um, he didn't teach me, uh, Rand anything. He just he like say, showed. He was, he was saying the moves. No. He was saying the moves, and he was demonstrating them. And Rand did say, "Maybe sometime I'll sneak my sword in again, and you can demonstrate them to me." He said that. So that means he's already. Yeah, shown and I and I told sword. Grandma I'd ride her. Big deal. No, but that means that he already has, and so therefore he is stealing moves from this old warrior all right uh so those are the new characters were there any new characters priscilla that stuck out to you the most ah very of course very was marvelous i love her yeah yeah she was great yeah she 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 got moraine's number yeah she knows she knows well yeah she knows she knows the stuff she knows the stuff yeah and she's very kind. Baba, out of the new characters, aside from the guy who gives Rand bread, uh, which one did you like the most? Well, I'm going to maybe show once again my book ignorance. But the one that stood out for me is because I've watched all five seasons and the movie of The Last Kingdom was on that show. He plays a character called Sith Trick, but he's part of the group trying to get the horn. So that was... I, I don't know his character on Wheel of Time's name yet, but he it's, had a good bit of named fighting. Masima, if you look it up in the uh, the X-ray part, is Masima. Yeah. Masima. Yeah, he had a good bit of fighting when the evil uh, army came in and took over that Riverside Village. Absolutely, absolutely. My favorite has got to be Elaine. I as as I read the books, I adore and dislike Elaine so much in so many ways. I'm not kidding. And, and it, it's 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 wonderful how uh, this position of privilege really endears me and repulses me at the same time. But it was so perfectly demonstrated in these episodes that I'm just I'm I'm team Elaine now. I'm, I'm like everything team Elaine saying everything so diplomatically as soon as she figures out that she's totally offended Egwene by commenting on what Egwene brought and then understanding where it is. And then I love that line. Uh, about the history of the White Tower and how some of the best friends in the history of the White Tower started out as people who lived next as sweet mates, as people who started out as living next door to each other. I just everything about it. And Bubba, I think you, you'll like her more also when she get to watching the third episode, because I thought there were okay. some really good moments in that. Well, I thought they did a very economical job introducing her, letting us do, know who this character is, and then also turning her around and showing she's not just a one-dimensional snob as the first impression comes across. I, so I did like that. This is Spawn Center. Good morning. It's Get Up. Greenberg with you here. And ladies and gentlemen, we're leading off with this very important story from this latest Wheel of Time episode where serious injury occurred to the quarterback of Team Trollic. We have Coach Trollic with us today to talk about what happened. Coach, thanks for joining me. What happened? Well, Greeny, as you know, we filed a grievance yesterday morning regarding the illegal play of a bunch of what I just call hooligans pinning our quarterback up to a door in some kind of worthless and deadly prank I mean, Greeny, what has the world come to today where these kids get out on a field and they feel like they can just commit murder? That's not the way we played the game when I played. Thank you, Coach. I understand that. And I don't want to say anything. I don't know anything. I haven't talked to anybody about this. But it seems to me that it wasn't that long ago that you talked about your hopes for the season of causing terror and general skullduggery. Is it possible? That when Skullduggery is turned around on you 
as it has been in the course of this last episode, that you think we might need a rule change across the board. Well, Greeny, I'm glad that you didn't include cannibalism, because uh, that's one of our other principles, and we really enjoy that part. And I don't think you have a game without that. However, I I can see how my critics are going to call this a form of hypocrisy or whatever that word is. There's not much humanity in what was done to my quarterback and GM, Mr. Fade. Fair enough. Have you heard any progress regarding your official protest to the league? Uh, Not yet, Greeny. We haven't heard anything from the office yet. I'm continuing to stay in touch with the owner, the Dark One, and we'll keep him updated first. I'm sure there will be a press release once we get a ruling. All right, Coach Trollock, thanks again for joining me, and best of luck to you and your team for the rest of the season. We'll be right back here on Get Up with our 1,738th straight day of talking about the Lakers. Um, Bubba, where did it land? Well, it landed on something I want to talk about, and that is the hunt for the horn. I got very frustrated. People go back and listen to those previous podcasts. I got very frustrated with parents. Oh, I'm I'm a you know non-combative, peaceful, peaceful person. In the very last episode, he just stood there and watched his friends die. And so I don't, I'm not saying you have to be violent. I'm not sure you have to accept violence. But I liked him standing up for himself, fighting for himself, and fighting for his friends at the end of episode two. Or getting drug on the ground a whole lot. He, yeah, he did that as well, but he did Downstairs. fight. Yeah, I guess he did fight. That's he fought true. back. Good for him. Well, when the ogre when the ogre shows you up by fighting off five guys at one time, you got to do something. You know, you can't just sit there in your shame and not, and do nothing, is what I suppose. I think the thing that struck me most, and then Priscilla, I'll get to you, but the, the thing that struck me most was that uh, his conversation with Ingtar over the graves. That mm-hmm. was chilling. There was him talking and and, uh, and his talks with Elias. I love I love the whole Elias. I wish they would have done more of Elias saying, you know, we're more alike than you think and actually showing him things. But we're seeing parents' abilities being demonstrated. He's All of his senses are pick, putting together a picture where he can figure out exactly like ha- what happened, just like Elias is doing. And Elias is trying to say, yeah, you, you're more, you're like me would do something and uh the whole idea of that revenge speech with inktar and that's where i think bubba you brought up a line earlier where inktar would or just slightly before that inktar was saying well maybe pat and fain had a reason for this or or whatever and uh and then when they're burying those people parents speech there reminds me i'm just gonna say the word starts with a b uh and it's not it's not a derogatory term. It's just a condition that Perrin kind of gets himself into. Um, that, that it's kind of a name that the fans have given him uh, when he gets into this condition where he just goes crazy. And uh, well, I guess I can say it, berserker. So uh, that's that's the kind of that's the kind of thing that I'm really looking forward to. I think they've set it up really well so far. Mm-hmm. Priscilla, how about yeah. you? What are your thoughts about the hunt for the horn? And Ingtar and Masima and Perrin and Loyal. We haven't talked about Loyal other than the fact that I hate that they didn't even mention that he somehow survived survived the the Mordoth blade. Loyal well, lives. Yeah, we are we are not talking about Loyal because there is not much to talk about Loyal, to be honest. No, mm. he is not in his uh, natural habitat with which is a library, most possibly. Yeah. Um and he is not doing much except for the the third episode, no, like yeah. where like he there is more impact to what he is and what uh, like is being done to him actually because he's like very passive in this first three episodes. Yeah, but and I... he's not he's not even giving pairing advice. He's just like, hey, we have to go here and oh well, we have to do this and that. But Perry, like I have to say, uh, he uh, he was already like a character that I really liked in the first season. 
but this second season, he is like, uh, uh, yeah, it's it's like it, it, you say that, uh, like at the beginning of the first episode, it says that six months passed, no? It's like, right. And like he has done a lot of like uh, commiseration in the six months because he he you can see already like a, an emotional change from him from the the first season to this. He is more like. Uh, to get this job do done, uh, uh, like mindset, but he's not without his moments of uh, of like doubt and intervention. So it was very. It, it, I think he is like from the Mayo characters is my favorite so far. Right on. Well, see, I I just love seeing Loyal, given how generally peaceable he is, you know, peace friendly that he is. Uh, that would go right hand in hand with the way Perrin uh, was badly at the end of season one. Uh, it seems like the, maybe he's got a little more anger in him. I'm wondering if it's from that dagger stab because he certainly hulked out against five guys uh, when they all had ropes around him and he really took off. The other thing about Perrin, uh, that letter, when when Nynaeve, and, and not only that, but Nynaeve read it, and uh it, that was very moving to me and then it made me so angry that leandrin left matt out of it because the letter when nynaeve reads it mentions matt and leandrin specifically left matt out of it to mess with his head some more uh but all of that was really emotional for me the beltine stuff uh perrin especially during the beltine stuff where he was going to take the ring off and send it off that's that was his wedding ring i guess with layla or whatever and then he couldn't he had to bring it back so much great stuff in these episodes just so well done yes the end near the end of or i guess the middle of episode two and then we find out i believe at the end of episode two the thing that shocked me is we saw a fade kind of you know nailed to a door right like yeah. like this army mm -hmm. had killed a fade and nailed him to a door and then yet I believe the, the the army that did this was the army that captured our heroes at the end. Probably. And it is an Ishmael with them. And so it's like interesting that Ishmael would be with an army that would kill Fade. It's very fascinating, interesting. You wonder, as a non-Brook reader, where this is going. You wonder where this is going. This is going. Yeah, because I don't think this is from the books. I don't I, I mean, I know that they visited a, a couple of villages um and the place where they're at at the end of or get captured at is the what is it called autons mill or something like that uh which is represented in the book but i think that by the time Perrin and them get there uh that has actually happened so it's cool to see them experience it as opposed to you know the show i guess the whole show don't tell but just just the horror of of it all because i think by the time they get there they're all kind of like no we, we don't know anything about the horn of valier sorry I'll move on <laughs> and horn of valier i've never heard of it what, what is that? i think it went that way yeah uh but at at any rate uh i just love the way how quickly uh this storyline is moving because this is the one that i expected to drag i expected them to get stopped here to stop there to to do all of these other things uh and I, as you, if any of you have watched or listened to my predictions podcast, I did not have them getting attacked by the sun sand until the end of maybe episode three or the end or even the middle of episode four. And well, lo and behold, this attack happens in episode two. And that not only means because that it is that location, that means that they're already out there on Toman's head, which geographically is the same area that where the Shan Shan landed, uh, a city called Falma, which means that, you know, things are going to come to a head out there. Uh, they may drag it out a little bit because there are some dramatic mm -hmm. things that happen, but they, they, there's, there's so much to get excited for still to come. I can't believe that they got all of this travel, travel, travel stuff out of the way in just two episodes. It's amazing. It's great. <laughs> Guys, I can tell this. Yeah. Like, We've taken all of the topic names off the wheel, but there's two left. And this little dial landed right in the middle, right on the line between these two topics. So, Bubba, if you can just please read one of them and, and start off with that and, and we'll go with that one. It's your choice. 
sure thing. Well, I'm pretty sure if I'm looking at it correctly, it's a, a double M. Double, double M. Menopausal Moraine. She has oh lost, she has lost her power and she's, you know, she's retired to Tuscany under the Tuscan sun, like everybody wants to. She's out. She's not even wearing her Aes Sedai uniform, which even somebody who once again has not read the books, I'm like, man, she is on holiday. She's going, she's getting water, she's hanging out. She really doesn't want to be bothered by those troublesome men like Lan. And when you can't touch the one power, what are you going to do? You can spend all night and read and not even wearing any rings. Whoa. So Moraine is certainly, she's always the focus of these posters of season one and two. It seems like she is the almost Gandalf and Frodo of, of the series at times, because it really feels like she's not the one. It's just not, not, not yet. Not she, <laughs> well, she wasn't wearing any rings. So, you know, what could you do? But she is taking on uh, something that I think I really wish I'd known oh. more of when the when when season one was happening. It's not just that we see Aes Sedai out destroying men and taking away their channeling abilities if they think they're dragons. It's that she's part of this secret mission to where she's not even, you know, Land's not her number one. Her number one is now Rand and supporting the Dragon Reborn. And so I do love that. It wasn't very active at times, but I do love it. And so to me, it's going to be interesting to see where she goes once she's finally i did get sick of the land stuff once she's finally sick of this anchor on her where is she going to do what where is she going to go what's she going to do i know that ishmael which is one of the forsaken uh, who is the person or should i say the entity at this point uh that moraine and rand helped release from the uh, from his prison um I mean he he is in the in, in all three episodes, right? I think so. He appears in all three episodes. I was uh I was very happy with him from season one. I was not that much happy about the confusion about who he was in season one, but I think this was exactly what they wanted, no. Huh? Um, but season two is very straightforward with uh, his motivations and who he is and what he's doing. Right now, uh, we uh, I hope, like in the fourth episode, that we are going to figure out exactly what his plans are with like the Lady Surov. Um, because I think, if I'm not mistaken, this comes also from the books, right, Matt? I think so. Yeah, it's been a while since kind of. Hunt. Yeah, kind of. No, kind yeah, of I, like this. Uh, like that. Uh, the we had a dark French soul show, yeah. no, and yeah, Lady Surov is. Uh, uh, she is a friend. Let's say. Yeah, that's she's true. a friend. That's true. No. Yeah. So I w remember when we were doing the uh, the, the like we were trying to figure out what it was happening like when they first released the pictures that I was like okay maybe he's not there maybe he's a forsaken maybe he's just like figuratively speaking there but not really there no but he was really there he was actually there yes yeah speaking of somebody I, else I who was, was like... actually there I mean I think that Logan should probably understand that he should not be able to see the one power uh especially after he's been stilled the guy got stilled by in the show the guy got stilled by them so he how i mean i don't say the word talent to me i don't care about the word talent book readers shut up i think that this whole bit he's talented uh, he's talented at telling lies that he can still see brand's aura that's what i think Right. I would think that the reason why he was up on top of the paladin with the army matching marching through town is because the Forsaken is trying to get uh, helps helpers and followers. Yeah, it really bothers me that she's really not wearing her colors more often. I mean, like she already lost her powers. Should she also lose her, fa her fashion? I don't think so. I think this is the... Um, 
if they are trying to say like through clothes that like she is not what she was before that she, she has changed i think uh they are not doing a, such a clever job because w what i get it from her situation is that like, she's pretending to the world that she didn't lose her powers like she's wearing this muted uh this muted blues still uh, and she's not like in her uh, splendor and stuff uh but she's still behaving like an acid eye she's like still like commanding and she's still trying to fight fades and stuff so I don't know. I don't know. I'm really confused by Moraine. I have I'll to tell you who's pretending. Rand is pretending, Priscilla. Rand is pretending because he's pretending that Celine matters to him when he's really just trying to forget Egwene. He's pretending that he needs to uh, actually help this guy, this poor guy with PTSD, when he's really just trying to steal sword moves from him. He's pretending like he wants to help Loghain too in some way, uh, at least to his bosses, just so that he can get in there. And who knows what he wants in there for that, uh, at least by the end of episode two. And I just think that uh, Rand is nothing but a big faker. Well, uh, let me say, Land should know that many people were telling him to speak less in season one, mainly me, because I think he's such a boring character. You know, like, hey, dude, zip that lip. And it should have been an interesting character. It's like, <laughs> hey, I was the heir to this city that got uh, overtaken by this hideous growths. But, you know, speaking of hideous growths, look at how big the Forsaken's nose is. There's two things that I want to talk about today. One of them, which has gotten a lot of heavy gas in terms of, uh, I guess, promotion or whatever. Lauren Balf released a single called Egwene Elvir. It's her theme, and it uh, involves big production. We actually heard a little bit of it at the beginning of episode one when we first saw Egwene going through and doing some of the cleaning. It appeared, I think, when she first was in the Amerlin Seats quarters, but I love the theme. Lauren released it a couple of days before the episodes came out, and it's pretty glorious. I can't really play any part of it because, you know, YouTube considerations. I don't want to get this particular video demonetized for Bubba. So uh, I'll just go through some things. One thing that happens is that when Lauren does stuff and there's singing involved, it's usually in the old tongue. And we have lots of experts out there that translate to the old tongue. Not the least of which is the people at 14th Street Music, which is a record company, which is essentially the way that Lauren Balf releases things. It may even be his record company. I'm not real sure on that. I haven't done any research on that. But Mr. Balf uh, always has 14th Street Music do these nice little production videos. You can find it on X. Just follow Lauren Balf, L-O-R-N-E-B-A-L-F-E, and he retweets everything that 14th Street does that has his signature on it. Anyway, the video actually translates the old tongue to lyrics that we can read. And the melody's really interesting. The verse part goes like this. And here are the verse lyrics translated from Old Tongue. Restless dreamer, restless dreamer, don't envy others, envy lingers. Even good steel rusts, be wary who you trust, do what you must. Those are the lyrics from the Old Tongue for the verse. And then there's this more open sound, uh, which I guess you could call a chorus or whatever. Uh, that sounds like this. And it translates to remember who you are, memories are never far, let the river guide, take each step, eyes open wide. And that tells a lot about Egwene's journey, at least at the beginning of this series, is the fact that she is a little bit jealous 
of Nynaeve, right? So I, I love that translation. I love that those lyrics were employed. The performance is really interesting. It's the one moment where the score jumped out at me so much that I felt like I was in a CW show again. But that is something I'm trying to get past. So forgive me for being so judgmental about that part. But I think it's really beautiful. The most important thing is that that's not the only time you hear that theme being used. In episode two, when Elaine finally understands that she has offended Egwene, really kind of in a way, and then recognizes that Egwene is from the Two Rivers area, or from Two Rivers. They don't call it Emmons Field in this show. But she realizes it. They really kind of formally in- introduce themselves. She is the daughter heir, and Egwene introduces herself as Egwene Alvier. And that's when we hear the theme again as Elaine begins to talk about how some of the best friendships in the history of the White Tower came from people who lived right next door to each other, from next door neighbors, I suppose. And it's very subtly done in the voice. I don't know if the lyrics are actually being sung or not. It sounds more like ooze, but maybe that's just me. I think there is a little bit of lyrics in it at the beginning, but there's this wonderful piano thing that kind of accompanies it that sounds like this. And then you hear the melody being drawn out even more that sounds like this. Wonderful adaptation of this epic poppy kind of piece and morphing it into something that works really well narratively for the show uh, using just more a, a much more instrumental type approach than rather the flat out full out singing approach i think that that's just one of the beautiful things that lorne does is that you know, you, you take these themes and you listen to them when he releases them and they're done, they're very performance oriented towards the, the singers that are doing it or, or how it's orchestrated with guitar or whatever. But then he takes those melodies, those themes, and he adds narrative musical context to them in an instrumental way throughout the course of the rest of the season, which I'm sure we'll hear Egwene's theme a few more times this season, given her story for this season since I've read the book. There was another thing that I found very interesting in these first two episodes, episodes 201 and 202, and in the third episode, is that there aren't any title sequences like there were in the first season. And I don't know if that's because all of three... All three of these episodes were released together, and then we'll get it maybe next week. But I think Lawrence said, well, even if I don't get my title sequence, it's still the main theme of the show, so I'm going to stick it in there when I can. And the main theme of the show kind of sounds like this. But where he subtly sneaks it in, just that second half of it, he sneaks it in when Moraine is carrying the buckets from the well back to the house. You hear it like this. And I love that. I think that that's great. It's like you don't need to hear the whole theme, yet it's an important enough theme. And originally, I believe, when he first did his kind of, he always does a concept album uh, that he presents to the showrunners and then they work from there. And I believe this was actually supposed to be Moraine's theme initially, uh, but it then instead became kind of like the Aes Sedai or the main theme throughout the rest of season one when he did it. Uh, for that season so because this is about moraine and he originally wrote it i believe for moraine so why not use that main theme and in a way that feels like moraine is in trouble not in a fearsome way or whatever it just seems a lot more dampened than the way you normally hear it and that's with those short chords going on underneath and that's all that i'm going to say about the music this week We'll get into some more themes next week. Oh my 
there's another go. wonderful game that we're going to be playing here. It's called That Sexy Scene here on Bustin' Blockbusters Podcast. I'm Coach T, your host. I'm back. Matt had to take a break because I kept biting on his Camelin barbecue. At any rate, <laughs> what was the yeah, most right. lecherous behavior that you saw in these two episodes? That's how we're doing that sexy scene. It doesn't necessarily have to be actual sex, actual <laughs> lechery. It can just be something where you see somebody desiring something that something else has or some kind of jealousy or something like that. So let's begin with you, Priscilla. Can you tell me what you thought was the sexy scene of these two episodes? Well, I really thought like when Matt is given the, the sweet bread that he sticks his finger on the oh on the jam <laughs> with Leandre in the same in the same like place and they're discussing if she's trying to poison him and he just like sticks his finger there and then he puts like there and like I'm, I'm yeah it's fine. You know what? I, One I thing think, that... I I think if she, had she continued there, like things would have evolved from there. The finger in in the what was it? Honey, honey cake. The sweet bread. Yes, sweet it was bread. a sweet bread. It was a sweet bread. Okay. Whew, that that's hard. Uh, <laughs> whoops. That's what she said. That's what uh, that's what uh, he said too. Yeah, Bubba. What oh. do you got for us? Well, as someone who loved fried fish and eating at Captain D's and Long John Silver's growing up, to me, the most sensuous scene, sure enough, was Loyal looking at those people carving up the smelly lionfish. And he's like, hmm, Loyal could go to town on a lionfish. But he meant it in a way of eating it and not in a way of actually eating it. And so I thought that was very, very, um, you know, beautiful uh, it was beautiful the way to <laughs> a loyal stomach is through his stomach excellent excellent yeah. bubba how about you matt coach what are we doing here uh okay so i'm not really thinking about whether it was actually lecherous or not but i'm thinking about the way everybody might have perceived it to be lecherous because perrin was so involved in scoping out what was happening at that dinner plate that dinner table where there was nothing but flies going around and everything. I think that uh, maybe Perrin has a fetish for murder. And this, you know, he, he was so intent on that. And everybody's just kind of like, hey, Perrin, come on, let's go, let's go. And he's just sitting there staring at it. So I think that perhaps uh, Perrin has a fetish for murder. Uh, and uh, we might see him fulfill some of those fetishes. Later. Perrin is preparing to kill. Matt, that was stupid. Let's move on. Thanks for playing the game, ladies and gentlemen. We did get just a little bit of feedback. We haven't really gotten any on these episodes yet, but we did get a little bit of feedback regarding uh, season two before it aired uh, at Eli Elvis. Uh, is going to decline to watch season two, uh, saying oh. that season one was an abomination. Whoa! And, wow. and, yeah, e Eva, Str Eli strong Elvis. words. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that maybe if you would just give it a chance, you you might like it better. I know that there are people that are still not going to like it because of so many book deviations, but I thought that the spirit of everything was captured beautifully. At the same time, uh, it. Uh, x y r three s is that xeris i don't know uh but from a book perspective uh yes the season one was kind of mediocre but non-reader reactions have been quite positive they did seem to genuinely enjoy it bubba you're our resident mm -hmm. non-book reader was your episode season one uh response quite positive i'd have but to, go back and listen to the once again there were positive moments maybe an episode really felt strong a moment in a episode i didn't enjoy was really powerful i was like oh this is great but this once again i've only seen these first two episodes of season two but it is so much more consistently good than season one ever was and so a part of me is like 
for people who who got to the end of season one but maybe struggled with it because it was as i would say a bit uneven come into season two you're gonna love it and if you're you've listened to this far in a podcast you probably have come into season two and i think you probably do love it i mean i i i think I have this reaction to the books so far. I think like the first book I I struggle with a little bit. Mm. The second, it like, it was very, it it was much better. And the third, better. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, I think that's just my opinion, but it's like the first season to me, it reads exactly in terms of my reaction, I, as I react to the the first book, there was like some moments in the first book that I really liked. Uh, altogether, I was a little bit uh, on the fence. It was positive, uh, but like n- not something that I would re- revisit. But the second book was much better, much better. So I, I'm having this uh, reaction also to the series. It, changes included. I think the changes that they did, like uh, in the first season, some some changes were very good, others not. I agree with you. The book two was kind of almost a reset, like Jordan just mm-hmm. kind of reset everything. It we reset this kind of question about how we are excited we were for season two on X, uh, and we did an X poll, which just it just goes along with everything else that's just weird about the internet these days. Let's do an X poll. Uh, on a scale of one to ten, how excited are you for the Wheel of Time season two? Is a poll that I put out, and really, we got a pretty decent response. That response uh, yielded the following results: that over sixty-eight percent of you were really excited to hugely excited about the episode, and the rest of you were only moderately excited to not really excited very much. 37.5% said this thing goes to 11, uh, 31.3%, eight out of 10, uh, which was really excited. 12.5% of you were only moderately excited and 18.8% of you were not really excited. So they were kind of on the uh, Eli Elvis train, I suppose. That's all we've got time for in the non-book reader section. So we're going to let Bubba go here in a minute. Reminder, we want to know what you think, because quite frankly, I'm lazy and I don't have a lot of time. And it's much easier for me to get your thoughts than for me to think them myself. Uh, Give me the opportunity to think up stupid games and things like that that nobody likes. But we'll be sure to include your thoughts in them as we go along. You can send social media posts to Bust Blockbuster or double PHQ, the word double letters PHQ. You can find the YouTube for these, these podcasts at the double P media family. You can also go to their website, double P media, the word double letter P, the word media. And you can pretty much contact me via email, Matt's audio blog at gmail.com. M A T T S audio blog at gmail.com. Let's give our personal Twitter handles as well or our personal social media or YouTube channels so that we can uh, interact with you individually without me being the overlord. And that would be Bubba first. Where, how can people find you on social media? All your non-book spoiler talk, send it to me, Bubba. All social media platforms at Fit and Trim. That's F-I-T-T-E-N t-r-i-m at fit and trim on your webs priscilla i know that uh you uh are, i don't know if you're going to be covering any more extensive videos on the wheel of time uh this season or not but i know that you have I'm a great a- youtube channel so could you tell people about it please before we go well i will cover wheel of time weekly so I think tomorrow, like Saturday, I will be posting in like a 20 minutes video like on my channel for the Portuguese speaking people that like to watch Wheel of Time, which uh, I hope uh, we have like a, a, a big turnout this year because uh, the first season reaction was uh, mostly positive. 
from the Brazilians uh, that I get in contact with. And uh, some of it that was uh, that were on the fence, they were waiting for the first episodes to drop to see if they are going to continue. But mostly they were they were very excited uh, for the Wheel of Time to return. So it will, uh, and uh, I'm not on any other social media except for Tumblr. I'm still on Tumblr. So. All right. Well, excellent. So Priscilla TV one on YouTube and we'll see you next time on Bustin Blockbusters. Take care. to Matt's audio blog at gmail.com and find all back episodes and other information at mattsaudioblog.com. Part of Double P Media, doublepmedia.com.